This is the Rex cohort doing our monthly check-in call for October of 2018. Uh, I will start by reading a poem by Mary Oliver titled The Journey. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began through the voices, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough in a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voice behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. So I think these are sort of sobering times and maybe that's kind of a sobering, a sobering poem for sobering times. How about that? It reminds me of uh, volume three of Lord of the Rings where uh, they're going toward Mount Doom and they're really, you know, they're having a hard time. And I forget whether it's Frodo or Sam sees like one star in the sky and that one star kind of just reignites uh, trust or hope. Mm. something more permanent out there than all the stuff. I think that's something we badly need. I know, I know, all the, than all the, the dust and crap that's happening on the ground. Mm. I was reading a, an article this morning off of a really interesting mailing list about Brazil and about why, uh, why the new far right guy who's very likely to win is winning. Like what happened? And it turns out that the far left broke trust over and over and over and over again, just like shattered it. So everybody's like, no, screw you guys. We don't want to hear you anymore. Uh, we're going to go with this tough guy who's going to go shoot all the criminals. Um, but it's, it's um, you know, just more evidence of the kind of chaos that's happening in different places and that's probably going to get worse. Yeah, there was a really extensive article I read in um, geez, The Atlantic, uh, written by someone, I think, from Poland. Mm -hmm. We've seen this before. Oh, my God, was that a good article. Uh, has anyone else heard of this article? Sounds familiar. Okay, I'm going to see if I can find it. Is that the one about McConnell playing such a crucial role? Oh, I think that is the one. Yeah. Well, it was written by an insider who's like who's a Central European insider and uh, knows all these people, and was just talking how detailed how country after country is going for you know the internal elites and nationalism and like it's a very familiar story and it's it's one of the articles I read a while ago was pointing out that Trump is very much a European national he looks like a European Central European sort of leader. Is this what, is this the article "The Suffocation of Democracy" by Christopher Browning? No. But that sounds like a good article. Oh, <laughs> really good. It's from the New York Review of Books, so it's a different one, but I'll paste, paste it into our Zoom chat here. Um, that, this one, the one I just pasted is excellent, and it is about Mitch McConnell, and it, it basically, God, <laughs> it basically says McConnell, this is a quote from the article, McConnell is the grave digger of American democracy. Well, I found it. A warning from Europe. The worst is yet to come. Polarization, conspiracy theories, attacks on the free press, an obsession with loyalty. Recent events in the United States follow a pattern. Europeans know all too well. Mm, there we go. What's the, what's the title of the article? Uh, a warning from Europe. The worst is yet to come. Mm. I'm going to send it to you guys in a minute. Thanks. Hold on. Thanks. Yeah, so par partly I've been thinking like, okay, what, what do we do, what do I do? And I guess we've had some, some Rex calls about this, like, oh, you know, what, what's the thing to do now um, with Mika and, and others? Um, but that's, that's high on my, on my mind these days. It's like, all right, um, so many of these things are happening. What, what, how do we actually sort of 
buckle down and get some of this done uh, in a productive way. There's a bloody chat. Ah, God. You found it? There. Oh, thank you very much. Beautiful. So I, let's, let's, let's leave, the, leave the gloomies behind for a moment and uh, just do a brief check-in and see where we are in the world of, of things like this. Um, anybody want to, to lead? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. Mark, you want to head into it? Like what kind of stuff you're, you're interested in these days? Uh, sure. Um, well, I mean, you know, one thread is about, you know, what kind of supporting, what, how can we support uh, dialogue or discussion or argumentation? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm more and more disillusioned about the prospects for that, particularly, you know, through various kind of studies finding that, uh, for example, the more you understand the rules of logic, the more it's actually more likely that your bias uh, increases uh, with that. Uh, there's, uh, there's a recent article on what's called my side bias. And, uh, you know, which basically kind of Im implies that people like, uh, uh, well the, well, the whole framing thing, uh, the question is how do you frame things and how, how does framing happen in a non-rational or, or, or more than a rational way? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that, that's kind of one thread. Uh, another thread uh, kind of in my life is that uh, um, kind of the, about, uh, actually maybe it's more like 15 years ago, I kind of, uh, I, I was involved in Buddhist meditation practice and have, still am actually, uh, but I was involved with the organization founded by, you know, one of the people and a few months ago they ended up on the front page of the New York Times as they're now part of the Me Too movement and, you know, ta-da-da-da. So, and this is happening across lots of Buddhist organizations around the world where, you know, j just about every teacher you can think of uh, is on some level uh, sexually abusive or taking advantage of power and so on. And so, you know, the, the, it's not of course exclusive to, to Buddhism, but it just shows how power seems to just, uh, I mean, there's just this kind of universal quality to it where people get attracted because of the power, they start exerting power, then that goes into sexual power and so on. So that's been, so even though I'm, I'm not in the organization per se, I know lots of people in it, and there's a meltdown happening mm -hmm. you know, through that. Um, so that's another kind of theme uh, going on. Those, those um, are two great themes. Uh, I, remember, I remember once long ago, I went to the Kripalu Institute, which is like a yoga ashram up in Rhinebeck, New York, and that whole kind of crystal zone of Western New York, or Eastern New York, rather, Western Mass. And many years later, Guru Dev, the guy who was like their founding guru and whatever, whatever, was booked and put away for a bunch of abuses. You know, the, the whole place almost melted down. They're still around, and they had to they had to heal after all that. But, but yeah, there there is something about these positions of power. There's probably also kind of a uh, what's it called the recency effect <laughs> here, where because Me Too is big and we're seeing a lot of people. Uh, in the spotlight of Me Too, we're noticing a lot more of this is going on. I'm not sure the frequency is up or anything like that. This is just always, I think it's always been going on at some proportion. And I think also maybe it's not completely rampant everywhere. I mean, it, it's really easy. And I think this is happening on the, on the far right and the alt right. Uh, when, when Donald Trump says it's really hard to be a, a, a boy in, in America these days, you know, and, and, and everybody who's trying to make a dent in these issues does a face palm. Um, it's easy to feel like, you know, anybody could fall from any accusation at any moment and the flimsiest of actions might lead to an accusation, et cetera, et cetera. So interesting how this is, this is unrolling as we speak. Yeah. And, and I guess a, a third kind of theme is, uh, uh, 
I mean, I've been involved in tech for a long time in, in those kind of perhaps in retrospect, kind of overly naively optimistic way. <laughs> um, although, if, well, so, so one aspect of that is that, you know, people like Buckminster Fuller would say, you can't change how people are, so we're going to work on the technology side uh, because we can work with that. And, uh, um, you know, and that applies, to, uh, there's many people, that, that's a common thought. And, you know, I think that's fatally flawed because I think as we're seeing now, it's not just that, um, uh, well, I think what we're seeing is the feedback from the technology side to the human side, and especially recently, like looking at Facebook and Google and YouTube and so on, where, you know, where we're seeing that the monetized uh, selling of our uh, fragmentary attention is actually directly affecting our own capacity to act sanely and wisely. And so, so it's not just that, so technology you can't separate technology from the business model driving it. And it's certainly not value neutral. And, and that doesn't bode well for our capacity to meet challenges because there's, you know, there's this ongoing question, how, how the hell can 40% of Americans not believe in you know, anthropogenic climate change? And how is that even possible? Um, but it seems to be true and it's, and it's not just in the US. So, uh, so that, that's kind of on one level disillusioning. On, on the other hand, it raises the question of how can we work more directly on kind of the human system? You know, like Engelbart, Engelbart talked about the tool system and the human system. And so anyway, that's kind of an, an, another ongoing theme. And, and in fact, that's kind of, you know, I'm trying to identify what I'm most concerned about. It's kind of that intersection of technology, society, and sanity, and how mm. those three things work together. I like that. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting in so many dimensions, Partly, um, one, of the, one of the things that jumps up at me is that I think, I think many people stick to positions that seem illogical, mostly because of membership and identity. It's that, it's that renouncing that position would probably mean ostracism from a group that believes in those things or that has held, held to those things as a position. And there's, there's now kind of, because, because these battles have surged so much into the foreground, some, some of the stuff used to just be background politics, but now it's like, this, this is sort of how people are identifying and how groups are, are, are connected. And it's, it's happening in churches, it's happening in lots of places where there used to be other discussions going on. Um, so people are really reluctant to renounce, like blow up their entire friends network and how they, you know, all their friends, you know, all the people they're connected to uh, in order to change these things. So they're in that sense, uh, and what you were saying earlier about how sometimes facts uh, the presentation of facts just strengthens beliefs. Uh, so one of the things I wind up seeing is um, how do we build bridges to new places of seeing or new places of thinking? Because for people who feel under siege or under threat and like abandoning any part of a particular set of beliefs means loss of membership in community and friendship and everything else, how do we create stepping stones through what looks like a horrible river <clears throat> to a place of, of, of better life together with, uh, with, with others? I, I don't know. But um, these, these kinds of changes don't happen easily. Um, and, and different places in the world are getting more and more rigid and using more and more fear, sort of pumping up the volume on fear. I made the mistake of, of finishing watching the documentary Icarus which is about blood doping and bicycling and in, in, in which a mid range bicyclist who realizes he's never going to be the next top cyclist decides what the hell, why don't I contact the, the best Russian doping guy and see if he'll help me. And then I can document the whole thing. Hey, Jamie. Uh, and then I can document the whole thing. So uh, amazingly, uh, this guy, Grigori, who's like this Russian doping expert who also happens to run the Russian anti-doping agency, says, sure, I'll help you. And then like spouts everything that's been going on. And it, like there's been doping for years. It goes all the way up to Putin, et cetera. So I finished watching Icarus, but then I also watched Active Measures, a new documentary about basically nonlinear warfare and all the other stuff that's going on. And everything goes back to Putin. And it talks about how Trump Tower was... Uh, a perfect place for money laundering from Russia and this and that, all, all kinds of crazy stuff. And um, at the end of it, I, I, I was let, a little shaken because I'm like, all right, all right, got to do some deep breathing because if, if so much of this is going on, um, 
how do we work our way past it? How do we build those little stones across the river? So sorry to, to, to riff on, on and on about this, but I think, I think Mark, you're tapping into some very, very strong things that are going on. So I just wanted to, this is Jermaine, can you hear me? Yes, you're just great. You're coming in five by five. Well, that's uh, nice because I'm here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Sweet. And it's actually on, the, on my lunch break. And oh my I, I God. realized that the timing worked out to basically give you, give you all a holla. A um, holla. We, we, and, we, we uh, can't pass bread through Zoom, but... Uh, the, uh, the conference is on the future of agriculture, primarily around livestock stuff, and I'm, you know, I'm giving the closing keynote, so um, I have to find the right balance between scaring them and inspiring them. Doom, um, doom, but it's all going to be okay. Yeah, uh, ish. Um, but it's been, it's been, it's been fascinating. Um, I basically, we had a speaker yesterday who was the, um, uh, let's see, I guess we can put it at the Brazilian Sean Hannity. Wow. Yeah. Um, except yeah, he's a print guy instead of a TV guy, but, uh, you may know that, uh, um, uh, Bolasaro, uh, came close to outright winning the first round election and almost certainly going to win the second round. By 2%, yeah, um, he would have been declared winner already, yeah. Right, he got 43, but uh, his closest opponent got like 29, something like that. So it's really unlikely that anyone else is gonna win. And he is, a, I, I might best describe him as a combination of Trump and Duterte. Yes. And uh, he's a charming guy. Likes the finger guns, apparently. Uh, um, and uh, this, this speaker yesterday was essentially going how, talked about how wonderful it is that this guy is going, to clear, is going to favor the producers over the parasites and is going to um, de deleftify the government uh, and purge, purge the leftists from the government. It was, it, it was fascinating. Yeah, I've never been so close to such intense evil. And, oh, uh, and you've been in Kazakhstan. That's true, but I never got really close to them. I mean, this was, I mean, I was sitting in the front row, so he was like maybe 25 feet away. Oh. Um, that's so, uh, that's very intense. Like the timing of your being in Brazil is, is crazy. I know, I know. Um, I, I actually did, did some tweets about it yesterday. Uh, met, I have met some interesting people, and I do need to move on from this, but I, just, I saw that the timing was good. I wanted to poke in and say, Hello to everybody. You know the the mobile version of Zoom. I can't really see who. You're breaking up um, now. So there's oh other oh, yeah okay. A few other folks. Can you hear me again? Yes, you were breaking up just a little bit okay. there right at the end. I, I was checking to see the other screens just to, to see who else was here. But I wanted to say hi since I know I haven't been in a couple of months. It's just been crazy busy, and uh, but you know. Um, the future waits for no one. The future waits for no one. And I didn't realize you were still in Brazil because I saw your, I've, I've watched your travels a bit. And I think I'll see you next Thursday um, at the Institute. Yeah. You will, uh, talking to a Brazilian company, no less. Bing. All right, folks, I will let you get on with your, with, with your conversation. I just wanted to say hello. Thank and, you. And uh, that I will uh, check in again more regularly once uh, things have died down a bit. Happy trails and break a leg. Uh, give them hell. Okay, ciao. Ciao. Uh, where did that? that was really wow. great to be checked in. That was great. Yeah, that, that was like bizarrely perfect timing. Can I just say how strange and wonderful that was? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, so John Oliver did a whole segment on Bolsonaro and his finger guns and everything else. Uh, and it, it's, it's crazy land. It's, it's absolutely fascinating what's happening there. Uh, there were, last year there were 62,000 murders in Brazil. That's a lot. Yeah, I know. Um, Susan, by the way, sent me a note that she has to teach something right now, but she's gonna join us at about 40 minutes in. 
Uh, so Susan will come and uh, join the conversation at some point. Uh, Mark, thank you for, for the things you put in the conversation because like that's, that's, I, I share a lot of your concerns and interests in, in, in that nexus of, of you know, did, we, did we take tech too lightly or, or too naively and how does this stuff all play together? Bo, were you going to jump in? Okay. Um, Todd, Todd, do you want to check in? Sure. I need to unmute first. Yep. <sighs> um, yeah, this is the, the autumn of action for me. I have a, a lot of things that I've initiated. Um, I'll, I'll post some links here in a minute. Um, in response to that question of, you know, what do we do when these times are so uh, dark and chaotic? Um, I think with some intentionality and some just instinct, uh, I decided I just need to throw a bunch of stuff against the wall uh, this fall. Um, and that feels good because my energy level is high um, I've not felt overwhelmed, um, except for fleeting moments. And, um, I spent, um, some time at NASA on the East coast last week, um, with one of my clients that's working through deep collaboration, uh, body-based skills with them. And that was just, uh, it was just encouraging. For, for as much as we hear about dysfunction in organizations and uh, dysfunction in government too, um, these people were all thrilled to be working there and they were all thrilled to be learning um, how to work with difference, whether they were engineers or uh, finance people. And, um, and they, they let me just walk around and explore buildings uh, <laughs> where I shouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that, that was a fun little bonus too. Um, did, so, you say, did you say body-based skills? Body-based skills, yes. So okay. uh, learning, learning conceptually what is needed in order to uh, meet another or meet or show up in a group uh, and then doing active skills with your body to train yourself um, so that those behaviors become more lodged. So you're actually asking engineers and finance people uh, to get up uh, and do strange things together, which there's resistance at first, and then it reaches a point where they just love it. They, they love that they're moving around the room and they're doing things that they're have full permission to do and it, everyone else is doing it, mm -hmm. it it's it's quite transformational really cool love it <clears throat> so i just put a link uh to uh the leadership training program which starts the week after next that i'm doing with marty spiegelman who um she jumped on the design from trust call didn't she uh yes yeah I'm so happy to see that. I, yes. I watched some of that video. Uh, and then I am co-hosting, uh, well, I'm leading a retreat next weekend to, to test some of the material I've been working on. Uh, and then I'll send one more here. That's great. <clears throat> wow. Um, and then throughout this month, I've been doing interviews with folks about consciousness uh, called the Oneness World Summit. And uh, those will all be released next month on 11-11. Oh, no. so What's it called? Chopsticks Day? No, Parallel Day? There's a name for 11-11. <clears throat> Chopsticks Day. I've heard that one before. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Do you want to, um, is there, is there any part of, of these events that we can help you think through or reflect on just as prep? Cause you've got a lot on your plate here. There's a lot coming up and it's, it's uh, cool to see. 
Uh, is there any part of this that we can help you ponder? Um, let Bo check in and then come back to me and I'm, I'm sure I have something that I'm chewing on. Cool. Cool, cool. Uh, Senor McFarland, would you like to jump in for a little bit? Yeah, um, I'm gonna put something in the chat. I went to this conference this weekend um, because Dave Gray had tickets to it and then he couldn't make it. So he contacted me, I think Thursday or something about it. Wow. So went, it was a weird, uh, very weird, very interesting. The thermodynamics <clears throat> of emotion symposium. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we integrated stuff like there's this, this guy, um, this uh, about he, Adrian Bijan constructal law. Have any of you heard about that? The constructal theory? I've heard of that. Yeah, I've heard of that? <clears throat> yep. I suspect you have, right, Jerry? I'd have to look it up to remember it, but it's in my brain. Constructal law. Everything evolves to facilitate flow. Right. Very good, Jerry. Very good. Hmm. Uh, and then, uh, then they, there's this other guy who's like a, a dog trainer. And he, uh, so he uses dogs to look at emotion and everything. So I got to tell you, I was in a conference where I was completely, you know, not, I was not there in the knowledge. You know, I didn't know anything, <laughs> which actually was pretty fun because, uh, so I just reserved judgment and listened, 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 listened. It was a small one at that Kennedy school, Jerry, you know, the Kennedy school. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> not important to know this but um Kennedy school is a beautiful bungalow school that was built to be a bungalow school so there's not no second floor and it's just it's really nicely oh it's really beautiful it has a courtyard in the center and anyways and so it's really well preserved too so it's fun to be in a school where you can like drink alcohol by the way you're just like yeah I don't know there's, there's something about that that's true and they have two you know four nice bars in that place they do, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the, the Kennedy School is one of the things that made April and me look at each other and go, hmm, hmm, where else do we find things like this? We need to maybe move here. Yeah. So um, I, I, I made it all the way to was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I made it to Sunday morning, and then I just got, I was felt sick, and I went home. And, and then I've been basically for the last Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I just stayed in bed. Mm. Um, I cannot say as yet whether I'm really like what happened in the conference i can't say that i agreed with it i can't mm -hmm. say i and i don't know you know whether i'll read more of the books that they referenced i don't even know if i'll do that mm -hmm. were there were there any nuggets any little shiny pieces that smelled interesting separate from the larger sort of framing in theory and all that were there little pieces where you're like oh that's interesting well the guy that ran it this william wilhelm guy uh larson he, mm -hmm. was, he was very good and um he was very good facilitator uh and uh i would say that it was really great to be in a conference that actually con concerned itself with human emotion and not in some sort of behavioral psychology way mm. uh and I, I, I must say it was very as far as uh emotionally uh sensitive and um insightful i do believe it was <laughs> so um, and i'm sort of shocked that it was yeah. um we did this constellation stuff where you work out family emotions you know all this, so it was it really was expert in that have you um they do horse constellation therapy oh my god yeah so uh, do are you guys aware of constellation therapy so uh, correct me if i'm wrong bro but as far as i know uh, you take one person who's the client of the particular moment you're going to do it. They think about their system, like who's connect, like who are they having issues with, et cetera, et cetera. And they write down the names of the different roles on different sheets of paper <clears throat> and they, and they fold them up so nobody can tell what the role is. And you hand them to the people in the group. And then you ask the people to just sort of hold, hold the role without seeing it and go stand in the room in some way, stand, stand somewhere relative to, the, the client person that this is about. And it turns out that unconsciously or through other energies, the people end up standing like facing away or directly, whatever, the people end up reflecting the dynamics that are in question. Like it's, it's like a tarot reading that works or something like that. We did, I, do the, did do the, um, 
the pieces of paper, they told the people what the role was. So that was very explicit. So them. they knew, okay, yeah. But, but apparently it's uncanny how these things happen. And I've heard you can do this with horses. And in, in, in fact that horses have insane sensitivity. Like, like horses are finely, finely attuned to emotion, to a whole bunch of other things. And so, so you let the horses wander around in the pen relative to, to the client. And that, and that seems to work as well. Got me. Okay, well, that, that really doesn't make me feel, all right, so, okay. Uh, then there's the, this dog trainer guy who's, who wrote all these books about that, and he uses dogs as, what he likes about dogs is that they're very, sort of pure heart is what he would call them. So he uses them as an analog to understanding human emotions. And actually, I got to say, the system is pretty elegant and pretty explanatory, mm -hmm. uh, which I was a little shocked at. Because uh, when I was, if you look at like the people in this conference, you're like, you know, what the hell? I mean, you read this like thermodynamics and human emotions, really okay. And then there's a, the guy who ran the conference is a tracker, like a, a guy that goes out and tracks people down, right? Mm -hmm. you know, like because of the footsteps and stuff, that kind of tracking. Mm -hmm. so this has got to be the weirdest conference I've ever been to, ever. And it was also so very Portland. I mean, at least half the people there were in Portland. Yeah. Which means that everyone is incredibly civil, sensitive, nice. <laughs> It was just nice to be with people like that. Okay, mm -hmm. what we were talking about. So anyway. <laughs> <coughs> Can you say more about dogs, Bo? What? Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to make the leap of understanding the connection with dogs. Well, the, since dogs have co-evolved with us, and in fact, there was just this theory, which was really neat. You know, we, Jerry, you and I were think about founding a civilization and what they were thinking about was maybe dogs being our co-hunters. Maybe that's actually what enabled us to, to have livestock because essentially when you have a, gar a dog who herds sheep around, you've taken the hunting instinct and subverted it to do that. So they, they posit that dogs might have been the founding of civilization because animal husbandry, for example. Anyway, so dogs are pure heart. They're not, they're not, they don't get, their heads don't get in the way of what they're doing. So, um, and since they co-evolved this, and they said horses aren't like that. Horses are different. So that, that they use that to say, to do an analog to emotion. And then it's all about, so actually the system has some elegance to it that I thought I'm gonna look into that a little more. I don't know if I justified answered your question, Todd, but frankly, I was bemused and the whole time I was just sitting there, okay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> What's, what's, uh, what's interesting to me about things like family constellations is that <clears throat> partly they seem to work and partly they seem to talk to people in a completely different channel from the logical channel of here's what the science is telling us about climate change or whatever, right? And, and partly we've talked a bunch in Rex about storytelling and the role of stories and narratives and all that. And, and some of these experiences are ways to break through to people's understandings um, and so, so I find that really interesting because in these settings <clears throat> or when you're doing an exercise where everybody's doing something weird, but, but they don't mind because everybody else in the room is doing the weird thing, you break through to some different place of being with each other. And Todd, I don't know if this is all useful for, for the work you and Marty are going to do. And it's probably similar to some of the, the exercises that Marty would put people through. Um, but you know, the getting constellation theory was really good at project. You project your emotions on a, a group of people. Mm -hmm. You mean that no matter whether the horses or the human beings understand anything, mm -hmm. it's really useful for projecting it out into the theater of life. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost a little bit like you know how how they discovered the Van Allen radiation belts <clears throat> around the Earth, and it turns out that like the Earth throws out force. Uh, way further than you think it does. And when you see an image of what they discovered of the patterns of magnetism and interactions, and then you bring in like solar winds and all that, <clears throat> that there's this drama playing out at, at these levels of radiation way further out in space than what you think. It's kind of like humans are like that. 
And we're busy throwing out all sorts of different kinds of energy, some of which we're kind of aware of because we're trying to convince somebody of something, some of which we're completely oblivious to because it's family history that's stuck in us and, and is trying to figure out where it is. And the constellation work is, is almost like a way of putting like iron filings and a magnet on it so you can sort of see where the energy is. Hey, Susan. Hello. We have had the most unpredictable conversation so far. Like who the hell knew? Who the hell knew we were going to get where we've gone? But hey, it's Rex. That's what we do. That's what you do. Yeah. yeah Sorry had... to miss it. <laughs> so so Jemay, Jemay dropped in. He's in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, at a conference about the future of agriculture. And he's the cap capstone speaker and he's going to try to not doom them too much but tell them where to go except he's in the <laughs> middle of the brazilian election um with bolsonaro uh, you know the far right guy about to be like made president and so we talked about that for a while <clears throat> and then bo our, our mutual friend dave gray gave Bo a ticket to a conference he couldn't attend here in portland uh called the thermodynamics of emotion mm -hmm. and there was a, a bunch of interesting stuff happening there, including family constellation therapy and uh, the role of dogs and a bunch of other things that, that Bo was like, eh? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, it was like the weirdest conference he's ever been to. So, so we've just been through a, a bunch of that, trying to figure out how does it fit, where does it take us, et cetera. Sounds wonderful. Uh, is there anything sort of Rexy on your radar or schedule that you'd like to check in on? Because we, we were sort of doing the round of, of check-ins. Well, I can uh, check in on the talk that I mentioned that I didn't do last week, last time, mm -hmm. which I just got through giving. And um, on uh, uh, working with bots mm -hmm. and the role of conversation. And um, I don't want to go through it all here, but it got an extraordinary response, positive. To my, to my, like, you know, people were coming out of the woodwork and saying, it's time to talk about these things. So I find it ironic that linguistics is now back in. And I said, well, yes, actually. <laughs> it never should have yeah. gone out. But, hey, I'm not going to complain. That's great. That's awesome. And, and bots, are, bots are poking their heads up in lots of different places. Yeah. We're doing a, we're putting together a, um, one more thing. I'm working with, um, Media X at Stanford mm -hmm. to um, um, put together, and you, you heard it here first, except it hasn't been announced yet, a visiting bots program. Sweet. <clears throat> so, Love that. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yes. And, uh, yeah. And so I've been deep into bot world. Mm -hmm. and, and I think... I'm astonished. I mean, I didn't know that there were just robotics. I didn't know there were 267 companies in the San Francisco Bay Area, robotics companies. Just in the Bay Area. Yeah. <clears throat> and are you talking here robotics companies or bot and chatterbot sort of social software? I'm talking about chatterbots, bots, IM bots, um, blue bots, red bots. So the whole thing? The whole thing. Okay. And actually, I think, I think what I'm proposing in particular would, would actually apply to, would be an interesting architecture conversational architecture for our interactions with, um, with uh, you know, other, uh, other kind of types of AI beings and avatars and mm -hmm. um, um, also uh, AI assistants. Have you read any Ian Banks? Ian Banks, why do I know that yes. name? No. Well, He's a science fiction author who invents, uh, it, it's the culture series. Um, and I read only one of them, Consider Philibus, was, was I think the first of the Culture Series novels. And apparently, as you keep going deeper, it gets more and more interesting. But, and a lot of this is about spacecraft. He gives mm -hmm. spacecraft really funky names mm -hmm. and then creates these plots. But there's like an intelligence in the culture that inhabits these vessels and that can hide itself and that does a, a bunch of different things and it just, it's an interesting thought exercise in what happens when machines get like really intelligent. So it, it might help you play with some of the, the bot futures ideas. Yes. Ian Banks. Yep. Ian uh, Banks. I'll put him in the chat. I keep staying away from science fiction because it's a whole world. You, yeah, I think tasting it every now and then really helps. Okay. <clears throat> I, I was, I got into it when I was in eighth grade. Yep. <laughs> it's about the time people do, sort of right after you've done volcanoes and dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. 
uh, here. Let me see. Here's the culture series. There we go. <clears throat> um, anyone else with thoughts on thoughts on bots? Well, I think that we need to think about collaborating with them. Well, so I've had this, what I'm about to say has shown up in conversation three or four times in the last couple of days. Uh, it, it sort of goes through alpha, explaining AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero and then talking about freestyle chess. So AlphaGo is the Google's Go playing game that was trained on historic Go games, the way you train, you know, neural networks. Okay, fine. And it beats Lee Dahl, and we sort of watched that happen. AlphaGo Zero wasn't given any historic games. It was only given the rules of Go, which are very simple, mm -hmm. and told, go play yourself for a while until you get good at this. And in 48 hours, AlphaGo Zero was better than AlphaGo. And over the course of five, six days, it got better than everything and everyone. And Go scholars are studying the moves that it began to invent. Mm -hmm. So it managed to break through some ceiling of capacity of even what we thought Go moves should be like, could be like, we're done. Because if you know Go, there's a whole culture of what move is probably going to get played next. Um, and in fact, in, I recommend watching the documentary AlphaGo. It's on Netflix. Yes. And they're, in game two, move 37 is totally counterintuitive. And uh, this doesn't show up in the documentary, but I heard that the guy who was sort of playing the stones for AlphaGo at first is about to put his stone down where he thinks that alpha is going to play. And it's like, no, no, it's, it's in a different place. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that, that was kind of creativity and innovation on AlphaGo's side. Then after Kasparov loses to deep blue years ago, he and a whole bunch of others go like, you know what, we're going to go deep into this tech thing. So they invent <clears throat> something that's called freestyle chess. It has a bunch of other names as well, <clears throat> but basically you form up teams and you're allowed to use any technology you want and as many humans as you want. And those teams compete in a game of chess. And it turns out that humans matched with software are better than just software. Yeah. Well, you know, really there's, another book, there's another book out by, I don't know if you keep up, <laughs> I don't always, HBR. Um, I mean, H, Harvard Business School Press. Right. A couple of guys now called Humans and Plus, with a plus sign, Machines, hmm. um, which I just read this week. And um, it's, of course, right, right in the space where I'm thinking, but I'm, I'm thinking that one reason why it might work. So, that, so if I'm right, let, tell me if I'm taking the right lesson here. Yep. So, so, I mean, there's sort of basically, there's the machine learning way of, of um, learning to play Go. And there's the rule-based version of playing Go. And we can't, tend to think that the rule-based stuff is sort of waning. And that machine learning is everything now. I don't, that, that's not the lesson I'm, uh, I, I, I got from. I understand, but is yeah. that true? Um, so interesting. So AlphaGo Zero is still machine learning neural network style. It's just that it wasn't fed the data of a whole bunch of historic games. It created its own history by playing itself. But the learning was still done. It was not a rule-based system. Oh, it built the rules. Yes. So okay. it, it basically absorbed how to play Go by playing Go against itself. Yeah. As opposed to what you and I know as expert systems and you know, the old fashioned AI, sure. where you actually build you know, explicit rules, et cetera. So yeah. it was not, it's not one of those at all. Okay. So what, my, my, what I'd like to know, I, mean, I will go watch it and see if I can learn anything, but is whether or not, I think the thing about conversation that I was trying to make is that the structure of the conversation, it's not like, um, it's not like grammar rules. Uh, it's like it, it emerges out of the interaction between and among people. And it's the structure of the interaction that I'm interested in and how that emerges over time and what kinds of building blocks we have, uh, many of which are meta reflexive mm -hmm. on the interaction, right? So, so I can see that how, how, how that could work. I mean, it must be sensitive to the emergent structure out of the interaction. Mm -hmm. um, one question I would do, I would do a quick Google search to see if anybody's doing research using TensorFlow, which is Google's open source neural network engine and, and bots. 
Like if somebody's crossed those two things together, like they're probably doing something interesting. And, and you had me thinking partly because I'm stimulated by AlphaGo Zero. Like, is it possible that bots could find a simpler way to answer questions that humans pose to them and could find shortcuts to establishing trust with humans? If they could understand that those might be the goals of an interaction, mm -hmm. might, might the bots find their way to very different ways of establishing trust and solving problems? You know, that's, um, yeah, I mean, I think, of course, I think everything's emergent, everything is emergent, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at the, um, at trust as an outcome. Mm -hmm. And I think that there has been a sensitivity, I think, I think some of this happens because it doesn't work in, um, in um, call center calls. There, people have been trained differently Mm -hmm. time because it didn't work very well. People got angry. Now I just get angry at the bot. Um, yes, I think, I think, I think it is this sort of back and forth and the timing of it. Mm -hmm. Not exact, but you know what I mean? There's a signal and you respond to the signal. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think so. And this, okay, kind tensor, of tensor flow and bots. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It kind of oscillates over time. Yeah. Yeah. And also we have, you know, we have human history with some of this technology from we used to use bank tellers to go withdraw and deposit money and cash checks and all that kind of stuff. And then money walls, you know, ATMs took over. Uh, and then, you know, when you call, who answers and how does that work? Uh, also, the call center was invaded by technology in hundreds of different ways that are super interesting. We've got a couple of Rex members who are really big on that. Uh, that would be Greg and Kelly. Uh, who really understand that side of it. I think, I think actually, I wish they were on this call because um, th that's territory they would be really interested in. Have you talked with them? This is the Consortium for Service Innovation folks on, in Rex. Uh, yes. Okay. Not, not for a while. Yeah. Not, not deeply, but I keep thinking I should go back. I'm a pink, you know, pink Kelly and say hi or something. And um, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a super interesting conversation for you to have with that group. Uh, because they, they must be looking at bots. And I think the, the perspective you're bringing to the whole thing is, is unique. So. Well, I think that, I think the, uh, they, they would, they would, I mean, it's only been, you know, how you know these things and then they only, then you, then they occur to you as if you didn't know them. Yeah. Um, and so one of those is thinking that, um, since I'm a big believer in the co-creation of value in use, that um, conversations uh, are the place where a lot of uh, value is created. Mm -hmm. And so they would, they would certainly have insight. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine they wouldn't. Anyway, contextual chat bots with TensorFlow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all over there. There's a chat bot magazine. Um, Fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, I was asked today, well, was I thinking about this for just for human machine interaction? And I said, no, I think, I think if, if we're successful in making the digital work more visible, more transparent, uh, in virtue of interacting with them differently, mm -hmm. and they're being differently architected, um, then, then I think we have another route to holding ourselves accountable and our machines accountable. Mm -hmm. And so if the same principles can apply, if the conversational architecture could be used in, in uh, TensorFlow and chatbots, that would be interesting. Um, I don't see anything in the, in the quick Google search. I'll have to look again. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just sort of a stab in the dark. I don't know, I don't know of anything like that. No, but that's, that's, that's really useful because that's gonna open up the whole question that, oh God. So I started my whole, my whole talk today with a picture of rabbit, a place that said, warning rabbit holes. Uh huh. <laughs> Did you use like a cover of Watership Down? No, I should have. I, I just went and borrowed a, borrowed a picture. Oh, good. Of, uh, yeah. And then, you know, then a rabbit going down a hole and then a rabbit coming out of a hole and <laughs> all of that. Anyway, it was interesting that the guy who was the CEO of Cognizant said afterwards, he said, I can't, you know, this is just, I can't tell you how timely this is. 
He said, I've been trying to hire linguists and I can't find them. Wow. He said, I could hire a hundred of them. He said, because it's the interaction. You could become the linguist employment office. You could just like connect up to the ones you know and say, dudes, hello, go yeah, send us. Well, you know, I, I, have a, I don't have that. I'm not part of the linguistics community any longer. Um, we should work our networks and, and, and cross over into some group of linguists who are like, oh, we love language, but nobody wants to hire us. We know how to do this. Sorry. Yeah. The people who know how to do this are, there's a bunch of them in England mm -hmm. uh, because they were Chomsky eyed. Mm -hmm. There used to be a bunch of people who did like this kind of stuff at the University of Waterloo. Um, I don't know if that still exists, but. Well, there are also the, there's all of the sociology ethnomethodology work mm -hmm. and conversation analysis. Mm -hmm. um, also, which also started in the sixties. Everything started in the sixties. We're just, we're just getting old now. So, so I'm. And it's coming back. Yeah. Partly what you're saying makes me think of, how much transparency and how much data is useful or needed? And I'll give you two, two extremes. One extreme is I just heard about an app that I installed on my iPad but I haven't used yet. <clears throat> the app is, is called Moody. It basically needs a 10 second sample of your voice of you saying something and it will feed back what your emotions are and a little bit about your, your personality profile. Oh no. Yes, 10 seconds, 10 second clip of audio. Um, and I have no idea how accurate or, or whatever. I, I think it's. Well, I, think, I have no idea whether I think this personality research and all of that stuff is. I totally, mean, totally agree. And, and I'm, I'm, pos I'm positing Moody as one extreme here. Yes, right. And the, the other extreme is I publish my brain openly online. You can infer a whole ton about me and my beliefs and what I think because it's all right there. Now, there's no API to the brain, nobody's done this. But imagine as a thought experiment that I was interacting with a bot that had full access to my published brain, mm -hmm. might it find ways, uh, well, it could probably easily find ways of manipulating what I think by understanding what I value and all that, but might it actually find sort of honest, truthful, trustworthy ways of giving me complete shortcuts to things that I need solved? Might, might, might my publishing a lot about how I think and what I believe be very useful in problem solving or whatever it is we're describing here. Cause I, cause I've, I've uploaded more of me than most people have. Yes. I was at Fujitsu's expo yesterday of all things. And there was a, uh, they, there was one guy there who'd written a, an API mashup tool, mm -hmm. which of course, Maybe you could use that to mash up your brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Research tools. Hmm. And sorry, I'm I'm monopolizing you. Anybody anybody else with thoughts on thoughts on bots? Well, well one thing that uh, there's uh, the whole idea of mental models and of uh, and I know that Demis Hassanis and the DeepMind group have been doing stuff uh, just with their TensorFlow now based technologies and so on. Um, and that also has a lot to do with the question of, uh, you know, modeling another person. So a bot would want to model you in order to do the kind of stuff you're talking about, Jerry, like uh, make Jerry plus plus be bot assisted in terms of using his brain and uh, developing a model, you know, derived from that. And then of course there's a model for self awareness, and which is also kind of interesting in terms of, you know, how, the mental model how, stuff. Could you use that though to infer the mental model that the bot has? Well, that's it. Oh, that's what they're doing. Well, that's the question is, uh, it, w would that develop more self-awareness for the bot? Because then the bot has some model of itself as well as some model of you. And because, you know, that's how conversations happen. You know, uh, you're talking, I'm developing my model. Maybe I might feedback to you, but then, then also, uh, you know, I'm positioning myself relative to you based on my model of, uh, you know, what you're yeah. Yeah. What's your, what's your intention? Oh, I thought about that work for years. Yeah. I didn't like it because it wasn't social enough in its assumptions. Which part? Uh, the, well, the, the models that got built that were the, the representations of the models that got, got done was sort of very scientific and very, 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 um, it, it was recognized that the model, the mental model was um, very partial, but not as partial as it actually is, I think, in 
because you can go into a conversation and go for so long without understanding each other. Mm -hmm. And I, and say, even on simple things like pronoun reference, you know, you, you, you think that the he or the she was referring to, was used to refer to a particular individual. And you, I heard that, I just did this this morning. They were saying something about, and I thought they were talking about me, self silly me. And they were talking about somebody else. And I thought, well, that's not true of me. That's not, you know, and I was like, and I said, oh, that's not who they were talking about. Um, Cause you had a model of yourself. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, but I think those models are partial. I think they, they, they take the context to be filled out, that, to be filled out. It's one of the reasons that we can, that language in particular, for instance, is very efficient, is that, that, that things can be used to refer to many different things in many different contexts. That's what makes it work. But the downside is there's not a one-to-one -one match. Mm -hmm. So I was so so sometimes the models to me were were excessively complete. I mean they were often used for you know things like uh, you know how does electricity really work? God, I still need to know how that works. <laughs> I'm sure I don't have the right one because I just tried to program my my uh, mate too, which is uh, controlling the uh, automatic turn on of the generator, and I can't get it right. Oh no. Oh no. We were um, up in Bellingham recently after a trip to Seattle, and there's an electricity museum in Bellingham, which is very, uh -oh. very, it's very good. Yeah. Like, I was shocked. And there was a whole, <laughs> shocked. I was, ha, ha, ha. I see, didn't, didn't, see, didn't even realize sure. I said that. Um, and uh, they had a whole area with early radios and TVs and like, like lots of, you know, lots of sets, lots of stuff. But then there was a lot of background. Uh, they went right back to, you know, the early flag semaphore systems and, and signaling and then right on, right on through. Uh, they also had a demo area with some Tesla coils and <clears throat> kind of explanations of what's happening and really, really nice. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, electricity, the models we have, the mental models that we have of electricity are seldom true. I mean, one that I was favorite was a German guy who was doing this, this for early days at IRL. And he'd figured out that, you know, a good metal, metaphor for, for amperage was uh, on a bicycle chain that there's, it's, it's ele not electricity, but it needs to be, you know, it's pulled or pushed. It's pulled by the thing you plug in and it's pushed by the amount of amperage, which is the amount of power that it's pushing. Mm -hmm. And you begin to start to get a, a different model of what's going on. A different feel for it. Um, yeah. I'm forgetting who it was. Somebody, <clears throat> somebody famous used to think of everything in terms of gears and cogs. And yeah. that, was, that was kind of his mental model process yeah. for a lot of things, but it got, gave him a lot of explanatory power. And I'm wondering, what were Nikola Tesla's mental models? Because yeah. Tesla had a better intuitive grasp of electricity and radiation yes. and all these the electromagnetic spectrum than pretty much any modern human has. I think, I think he understood it more deeply than, than most people do today. Um, I don't know that he ever articulated them, et cetera, but, but for example, he invents out of whole cloth the electrical grid as we use it today. Everything from, uh, from power stations to high, high voltage uh, transmission to you know the substations to the plug in the wall he like he invents that and pretty much it works like out of out of the shoots the, yeah, the way he does exactly. the way he designs it it's insane yeah. it's, it's sort of like mozart you know composing whole symphonies uh, first pass yeah yeah, yeah. but I I, I I i blame mental models for his ability to do that he somehow he somehow got somewhere where he could picture well or faithfully what was actually happening behind the scenes and I think mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of what we're talking about with stories and narratives is also this mental model stuff. And there's people like uh, Shane Parrish at Farnham Street and uh, uh, Blackrock, uh, Dalio, and a bunch of others who are busy working their way through kind of more analytic mental models. They're, but they're, they're making big collections of mental models, which I'm collecting over in my brain. I put a link a little earlier here to useful frameworks. Wow. Um, but but a lot of those mental models are good for statistical male kind of things and they're not good for social, you know, intuitive kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's because our mental models of how those things work aren't, aren't um, sufficiently human mm -hmm. or social, I would say. 
We know a lot about being human now, mm -hmm. but we don't know as much about being social. Yeah. Or we don't, we know it, but we don't behave as if we know it. All too true. Any, I yeah, I know. Any, any other thoughts on, on? Oh, well, one more thought on that. Oh, please. Well, the, the, the idea that you put something out there to, you know, I mean, presumably, I mean, Tesla did lots of drawings and writing and all kinds of things. He externalized what he was thinking or understanding. And often you put, put it out there and you go, well, that's not what I meant. And then you draw something else and you revise it and so on and so forth. Um, but it was also, what was interesting at the early days of IRL, was we had a lot of attention to, um, to teaching math and science, which, you know, and, and the mental models and the sort of, you know, uh, uh, mind bugs that people had, as John C. Brown would refer to them as. Uh, and, and all of that, so trying to understand how to, to do that. But uh, someone who was in the School of Education down at Irvine wrote a dissertation on how it is that people solve those story problems, which mathematical story problems, mm -hmm. those have been around since Egyptian times. I mean, and <laughs> we've been trying to figure out how to get people to do this forever. So, um, but, but what he, he studied, people who were professionals who used a lot of math. math. And uh, there were about four strategies that people used. One was using those formulas that were taught. One was, um, which very few people did, uh, but the people who the people who got the most right answers are the people who drew pictures. My grandmother's at this station, and the trains oh. over here, and the blah blah over there, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they had to build the context for the story. So a lot of what's going on, also not just the social interaction stuff, but a lot of it is we are we index to the context uh, very thickly. Mm -hmm. And the more we do that, the less transferable um, knowledge is. So I, for a while, I had this wild knowledge idea, which was um, that, you know, if you have, if you get, if you get, you know, corn from um, native corn seeds, and you try to plant them here, they're not going to grow. And so what happens when you tame it is that you get to know more and more about the context and what context it's in. Then, and then we elaborately construct a field and elaborately construct all the, all the amount of water it needs and the fertilizer it needs and the sunshine it needs and everything else. And then we, and we fit the seed to that particular context. And Lord knows we've been able to produce a great deal more food. But um, I think that's one of the things that we fail to understand is how much we need to externalize the context, how much we're depending on the context, you know, that our understanding is even when we're not having a conversation and even when we're not mentally having a conversation with ourselves, but we're putting something out there, writing, art, you know, um, it's how design happens. You put something mm -hmm. out you go, oh, oh my God. <laughs> no, 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 no. The wrong color of paint. Mm -hmm. And it would be lovely if we could elaborate, <clears throat> elaborate on these scaffolds that help us think and externalize and converse. <clears throat> if we had more variety and more memory of them. I think I'm just, I'll settle for just awareness that that's how it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yes, there are many, many, many ways. And all of those disciplines, you know, they have ways of doing it. It's true. Um, Bo, Mark, any thoughts on this? We've, we've gone over the hour, so I, I figure we should wrap the call pretty soon, but and does this spark anything for you guys? Well, I think this notion of our be, ourselves being anticipatory uh, systems. So, you know, it's like that whole question of uh, how do I know what I'm going to say before I say it? And how do I know that I didn't quite say this right? I didn't quite. So, you know, as I have some tacit model in some vague sense of what I want to say and, and that I go for it. And so in terms of bots, I think what we'd want is similar kind of anticipatory, uh, you were using, you know, notion of context, you know, what context am I in? What is important for me today? 
Uh, and therefore, you know, what are the important bits and pieces and so on. And so, we, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say yes, yes, and. <laughs> yes, and, and I think we, we uh, I think I'm getting kind of annoyed with all the attention that gets paid to emotion and how much that has to do with everything. I mean, that certainly we have emotions and we have emotion and that's relevant, but what you were just replying to is even more important, I think. It's, it's like, I don't anticipate what a chatbot's going to say. <clears throat> And it's not just because I don't know the answer to the question that I'm asking. I just have no model of how it's going to get there. Mm. Isn't wait, but isn't part of a chatbot's design to emulate human discourse, and therefore it's going to greet you first, and then it's going to repeat what you said last, and then isn't there isn't there a predictable rhythm to that? Isn't that part of the, the design of, of, from the earliest chatbots? Uh, some of them. Because they're trying to emulate the, the sort of yeah, but uh, game. Yeah, the model that they're trying to emulate is not how it actually works, is what I'm saying. Mm. That's, yeah, yeah. There's a disjunct between what they think is happening and what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we try to make it all neat and clean. Right. But things aren't quite that clean. I remember going out and trying to fix the fence out here and I had to have two vice grips and a wrench and everything else and I was in tears because I couldn't make it work. And so I went back to the, you know, back to Brian and I said, Brian, I just can't do this. And he came out, he had the same thing. The vice grips fell off. You know, he couldn't get the wrench to stick in this position that he wanted it to stick in. And he just kept going until he got it to work. And I said, oh, I see. Yeah. Messy is good. No. <laughs> it's not good. I mean, look, my book, books are all organized, you know? That's right. By color, like a bookstore. You could reorganize them by color. You could. <laughs> it, looks, it, it looks, it looks really, really nice. Is, but people do it. Yeah. yeah. There was a bookstore in San Francisco that used to organize their books by color. It was really pretty. Yeah, it is. Hard to find unless you know what color you're looking for. Yeah, but but a lot of people do know the color of the title that they're looking for. Yes, I yes I, I know most of the colors of the books that if you tell me a book I'll tell you what color it is. Kind of funny, isn't it? Ridiculous. The, the alternate well, index method. Mental energy. Except that I think it's automatic, right? It's you're taking a snapshot of the context. Exactly. Exactly. Any uh, any closing closing thoughts <clears throat> on anybody for, from anybody on, on what we've covered, whether it's uh, Bolsonaro and Brazil about to take Brazil down the tubes or anything else? We're cool. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. This has been a completely interesting check-in. I really I really appreciate it. Susan, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, fresh from your talk, yep. uh, I think it all all worked really well. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for accommodating my being late. Oh, worked out just fine. Okay. Bye-bye.